Hello, welcome to this afternoon's webinar hosted by Yayasan Mitra Museum Jakarta in association with Museum Textile Jakarta, Plaza Indonesia, and the Bin House. Today's webinar is to commemorate National Batik Day, which was on October the 2nd, and the upcoming National Museum Day on the 12th of this month. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank and welcome Zamri Mamat from Plaza Indonesia. Are you here? Anyway, Juliana Siswandi from the Bin House, Ardi Haryadi from the Jakarta Textile Museum, members of Yayasan Mitra Museum Jakarta, and all of you for joining us today. Hi. First, oh, hello. I was uh, mute just now, but now I'm okay. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. Thank you again for um, helping us with this uh, webinar today. And then we have Juliana Siswandi from the Bin House. Hello. Okay, wonderful. And Ardi Haryadi from the Jakarta Textile Museum. Hi, Auguste. Oh, hello. Hi, everyone. Okay, so our guest speaker today, Peter Lee, is a very distinguished scholar of Prana culture, for you who do not know. Honorary curator of the NUS Barber House and Pranakan Museum in Singapore. And also the author of this book, Sarongkabaya, Pranakan Fashion in an Interconnected World, 1500 to 1950. This year, Channel News Asia aired a four series documentary on the ancient kingdoms of Southeast Asia, hosted by Peter. If any of you would like to ask questions, please do so in the chat box underneath, and we will discuss them during the Q&A session. I will not delay any further so that all of us can enjoy Peter's presentation of Pranakan Batiks from 1850 to 1950. I will hand over the floor to you, Peter. Hello, August. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that uh, nice warm welcome. And also thank you to the Yayasan Mitra Museum Jakarta, as well as Plaza Indonesia, Bin House, and the Textile Museum of uh, Jakarta for organizing this and giving me this opportunity uh, to just share some insights um, about Batik in Indonesia. Um, if I may, um, sorry, can everyone see the, um, the PowerPoint? Oops. Hang on. Sorry, so I think, August, can you see me? No, uh, I can't see the PowerPoint. Sorry. Oh, okay, so I, have to, I might have to share it again. It's all right. There we go. Uh, okay. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I thought today to share some, in, some thoughts on the batik from Pranakan Chinese workshops in Java. Uh, with Well, I, I'm going to start a lot earlier, but yes, roughly 19th century to mid 20th century. Um, I, I am, sorry. Today, I'm just going to run through a couple of key points here, which I've outlined on this uh, slide. Uh, firstly, to look at the taxonomy and origins of the Chinese community in Java. Then uh, a very quick historical global survey of resist dyed textiles, following which um, I would um, like to uh, highlight the Indian trade textiles and the Chinese involvement in their retail. Then a very fun uh, look at the sarong, followed by um, an introduction to early Javanese batik, then the development of Chinese batik production in Java, and finally, to looking at some works created by uh, Chinese-owned batik workshops in Java. Um, very briefly, I, I, I thought to 
introduced this Pranakan taxonomy, especially in reference to um, terms that were used in Indonesia. Uh, Pranakan is something we're all familiar with. In the Malay world, it, it, it actually just meant any kind of, of uh, non-local, non-local born foreigner. So you could be a Pranakan Gujarati, for example. Strangely enough, in, in the 18th century, it, it, it began to refer to uh, Chinese converts to Islam. And by the 19th century, early 19th century, we can see that the, the meaning changed and Raffles spoke about Pranakans as um, the Chinese community that had been there for a very long time that were practicing Chinese rites and rituals. Um, we see these very old terms, Baba, Nyonya, and Nyai, in the records of the Chinese Council of Batavia. And so these Chinese characters next to the, the, the words, the terms, are what we see in 18th and 19th century Chinese records. Baba, um, Nyonya is spelled in this different way to what it's spelled today. In Hokkien, you read that as Nyonya. And also this term, which is completely outmoded, but we see it in Batavian records, Nyai, which is of course Javanese, um, could be a term for respect. It could be a title. It could also mean a mistress. Um, and it's transcribed in this very strange character, which doesn't exist in a normal dictionary. And it referred to the wife of a Chinese in, 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 in Indonesia at that time. Um, just quickly on origins, um, the, the Chinese community in Indonesia mostly came from Fujian, which is here next to Taiwan. Um, this is the province itself, Fujian province. The uh, main areas we're concerned with are the, the ports of Quanzhou here on the top right, Zhangzhou right further south, and Xiamen. Quanzhou was one of the biggest ports uh, in China up to the uh, thir perhaps 13th century, uh, with the Mongol invasion um, sort of ended the dominance of Quanzhou as a port. Later on, uh, Zhangzhou further south kind of gained ascendance as, as, as the sort of provincial port. And then following that was Xiamen. As a result, we find that um, Ma Huan, who was in Java, who followed Admiral Zheng He. Uh, as a result, Ma Huan had a report of um, noticing that the Chinese who were in Palembang and Tuban were all either from Zhangzhou or Quanzhou. And the, this wave in the 15th century was largely caused by the Mongol invasion in the 13th, 13th century or so. Um, and it, it, it led to an exodus of, of Chinese Muslims from Quanzhou, and they ended up causing a lot of trouble in Southeast Asia and Sumatra, especially. We know in Palembang, um, the Chinese Muslims even overthrew the local rulers. And anyway, it was a bit of a chaotic time. By the 17th century, we see evidence of uh, Chinese Muslim Shabandas in Banten, uh, a certain Abdul Wakil, as well as uh, an important trader called Ke Chu, who had a, a Banten sort of title called Kiai Ngabehi. Uh, he helped negotiate relations between the Sultan of Banten and the VOC. Come to the 17th century, we see a huge influx of Chinese into Batavia. And most notably, we have someone called Bengkong or So Bengkong, who was the first Chinese capitan of Batavia. And um, more interestingly, his wife was a manumitted slave or a freed slave called Nyai Inkwa. Um, they had children and adopted children, including two Balinese girls. Uh, and it just gives you a sort of feeling into how very quickly um, the Chinese became mixed race uh, in, in the Nusantara. Um, here, of course, is a family tree of the famous Han family of Lassam and Surabaya, the, the, the founder of the, the head of the, the, the founder of the family is Han Xiong Kong, 
But what is interesting, he had two sons, one called Han Jin Kong, who became Suro Penolo. He, he uh, received a title from, uh, actually, I'm not very clear, but I, I think one of the rulers in East Java. And another son, Han Gui Kong, became the Chinese capital of Surabaya. Um, so again, from this mid 17th or late 17th century onto the 18th century, we see uh, various response to the arrival of the Chinese in Java, some working very closely with uh, the local rulers and then some with uh, the Dutch colonial government. Um, now, just very briefly, I, I think it's worthwhile to look at the history of resist dyed textiles in world history. Interestingly enough, the, the, the two very early fragments uh, that we that have survived are actually kind of connected to the Greek world. The oldest known fragment uh, was is from the fourth century BC. It's it's a batik wool sarcophagus cover with Greek inscriptions that was found uh, in an archaeological site in the Taman Peninsula in the Black Sea. This is the area that's sort of um, kind of very controversial between um, Russia and uh, and the, um, sorry, my, my, my brain isn't working, but anyway, uh, Russia has taken over this, um, this part of, uh, yeah, of the Black Sea. The, the next uh, interesting fragment was actually found in Xinjiang, in Nia, dating to the second or third century to the Eastern Han period. It is a cotton fragment, almost certainly not Chinese, uh, depicting the Greek goddess Taiki, holding a cornucopia, as you can see. Um, but interestingly, in, in the next sort of border, uh, you see this very sort of Chinese looking dragon. So, you know, it, it's interesting how hybrid and uh, the culture was and mixed up in this part of the Silk Route uh, with Greek influence, Chinese influence. But um, I think, Archaeologists and scholars agree that this is not uh, Chinese. It, it, it probably comes from Kushan or even Kashmir. Um, when we look at as uh, resist diets in China, we see we now have this term called xie. And in, in Chinese resist diet textiles, there are four main types: clamp resist, jia xie, wax resist, la xie, tie dye. And ash resist. Um, this is possibly one of the earlier examples, also from the fourth century. Um, as you can see, it's 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 much it's a type that we we know today or more familiar as uh, shibori, but um, we know know it in Chinese records as jiao xie. Um, and of course, in 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 Indonesia, this is related to a uh, tritik and plangi. Um, this is another kind called clamp resist. So um, usually maybe a block on two sides um, would be dyed with, would, would be uh, clamped very tightly on a textile and then dyed. And these date to the eighth to ninth century. Um, examples have been found not only in the Shoso Inn in Nara in Japan, but also as fragments from Tunhuang, which now uh, survive in the British Museum that was discovered by Oral Stein. Um, next, we have a, something called Hui Xie, or what they call ash resist. Um, ash was mixed into a paste and used at a time apparently when um, wax was not that easily available. Uh, and this is also an 8th century example found again in Xinjiang. Um, moving on, I think it, uh, it, it would be good before we think of batik to look at Indian trade textiles that were traded all over the world and to Indonesia. I'll also look at how the Chinese community pay, played a part in its circulation in the Dutch East Indies, and also its very close connections with batik persisir. Um, examples like this uh, dated have been carbon dated to the 14th and 15th century. Um, they were made in Gujarat 
found in Eastern Indonesia. Many have been found in Sulawesi uh, and the, they can be three to five meters long. Um, here's another example at the Asian Civilizations Museum on a red ground. Um, on, on the subject of the red ground, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that when you look in old Javanese texts, so for example, if you look at the top right corner, I have two uh, samples from the Kakawin Krishnayana, which is dated to the early 12th century, referring to princesses wearing bright garments. Uh, old Javanese texts are full of uh, references to royal uh, figures and aristocrats wearing very, very colorful, bright garments. Um, I particularly want to draw your attention to this because as you can see, these red and blue colors relate to what we know in batik as bang, bang biru, red and blue batik. And of course, this tradition goes right to, you know, very early times. And um, we unfortunately have developed in, in sort of batik history writing, the idea that north coast of Persisir batik is gaudy and, 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 and sort of rough, kasar, as opposed to the refined, courtly, subdued uh, batiks with their subdued colors. And in fact, uh, if we look at old Javanese texts, we can see that actually uh, textiles were very bright and there were no such prejudices against bright colors in Java uh, in, in, in the early period. Um, these same fragments were traded to Egypt. And I'd like to draw your attention to these that were found that clearly show uh, imitation uh, ikat designs. So what happened very early in, in, in Gujarat was that you know, with, with printed cottons, one of its most exciting and interesting features was that it could copy any design. And ikat patterns were one of the you know, very popular patterns that were being traded overseas from India. And obviously cheaper versions like this were, were also equally popular as they were more affordable. Um, and these date to the 15th century. And here we find traded to Southeast Asia, very similar types, but we have examples that are quite, that are later. With ikat, we also find like with batik, these two words, although the techniques were known in, in India as well, uh, the international term nowadays are Indonesian, and that's to Indonesia's credit. Uh, however, the old uh, term that we find, find in old Javanese texts is apus or mangapus, referring to some kind of tying. Uh, but already by somewhere between the 13th to 15th century, we see in this Kidung Sundayana references to Sinjang Patawala Willis or green patola skirt cloths. So um, already by that time, uh, Gujarati patolas were being, double ikat patolas were being um, exported to the Nusantara. And uh, slightly, at, and almost at the same time, we see that copies that were block printed, uh, resist dyed as well, were being traded. Um, here are more imitation ikat designs, uh, this time made probably in the Coromandel Coast, traded to Indonesia. Um, and the popularity on on the left, we see this Balinese Gringsing ikat design translated into um, a block print and, and tulis or hand-drawn uh, batik as well. And as well as on the right, another version, and we see a lot of this um, in Indian tra trade textiles traded to Indonesia. Come to the 17th century, we see these references to Chinese shopkeepers selling uh, Indian trade textiles. So the first one we see opposite the town hall on the west side of the square is a wooden building with five entrances and inside five corridors, which on all sides has been divided into shops. Most of those in this textile and clothing market are Chinese who must pay three Reichsdalders for each shop every month, the leaseholder. Uh, they sound very much like uh, Pasa Bringajo in Jogjakarta today. And these markets uh, have been around since the 17th century in, in Batavia. Um, and again, in the, that comment was by Nicholas de Graaf and another one by 
uh, Newhoff, who also noted that uh, all these clothings and painted and unpainted linens were in the hands of the Chinese. Uh, here we have, of course, a famous painting, the Rijks Museum by Andres Beekman. And on the left, well, this is the, apparently the fish market, but it gives you a sense of what uh, a market in Batavia would have looked like. And I'm sure the, the textiles market looked pretty much the same. Uh, take note, uh, in, in the foreground, a lady in an in, Indian in trade textile. We have here an illustration by Georg Franz Müller of another mixed race Dutch lady wearing this kind of skirt cloth. And another one by Kaspar Schmalkalden, also dating to the mid 17th century. Um, and uh, you can see here that transparent bajus uh, were even worn by Muslim ladies in Makassar in the late 19th century. Um, just like that, that uh, illustration by Schmalkalden, this is the late 18th century uh, sarong um, made in the Coromandel coast. You can see that it, the, the structure of it is very much like we, like a sarong from the 19th century with the kapala or the head in the center of the cloth and the badan on, the, on, on both sides. And with the same kind of sawtooth or tumpal designs. Of course, the other format, like the kain panjangs, you see with the tumpal sawtooth designs on both ends. This is a particularly fine example made for Eastern Indonesia, this type with a black lace, imitation lace-like border. Um, have, types like this have been found in many islands in Eastern Indonesia, like Aror, Timor, um, and they seem specifically only to come from there. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the little red dots all over. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, North Coast Batik would be, uh, would understand this as the, what we call Chocho Han or the pricked red dot patterns. And we already see this in 18th century Coromandel Coast textiles for Indonesia. Uh, another kind that was exported in huge quantities, uh, sometimes called the kain gabar or double cloth or kain dodot. And here is a detail. Uh, what I think is particularly relevant when we think of batik is how uh, already in India, we see cloths made specifically for the Nusantara that have, you know, uh, two patterns just thrown together. Um, this is sort of an aesthetic, which I believe is very much Indonesian. We don't see the, the same kind of textiles made for, for Europe. Uh, these were made for Indonesia and there was this love of clashing patterns. Um, the, the background isn't just a, a, a pale blue. When you look closely, you can see um, the Tulis sort of um, whirl, whirl, whirlpool sort of like designs, um, very, very intricate and um, difficult to do. So the entire background was um, executed in this very intricate way. Um, and more examples of um, Indian trade textiles for Indonesia, is again, the references to sort of bungee-like designs and these little red dots, which we see in North Coast Batik as well. We also see many examples of imitation checks. Again, we see this in North Coast Batiks and also of course, tamban or patchwork patterns. Uh, so all these are very much rooted in textiles for Indonesia that were made in the Coromandel Coast and Gujarat for uh, the Indonesian market. Uh, we also have very fine examples made in the Coromandel Coast for Europe with a uh, gold leaf. Uh, the detail on the right, you can see it looks yellow, but it's actually gold. Uh, and the entire Palampo on the left with a tree of life um, is covered in gold leaf or Prada. So even, you know, we know this is Kain Prada Indonesia and this 
style or technique was also very prevalent in India. And there are these very kind of strong and deep connections between the textiles uh, from Indonesia and India. Then there's a whole range of Indian trade textiles with these floral scrolls. Again, I'm, it, you know, it, we can see the deep connections with North Coast, uh, Bang, Bang Biru, uh, Lassam textiles. And as well as th this, these different kinds of background filler patterns or isen, like the cross hatching we see on, on the border. Uh, and this right on the, on the left register, this sort of like a fence like design with a crisscross, which actually comes, I think from lace, but we see that in pers Batik Persisir as well. Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to this Palampo. And if you look at the floral patterns, uh, uh, I mean, the filler patterns for the flowers and the leaves, you see this astounding variety of isen or filler patterns, many of which are exactly like the isen you would see in Batik Persisir, um, including, you know, the sort of fish scale and little florets. Um, and and the, the, the connection, and we, we often think of Batik isen or the Isen for, for Batik is something so quintessentially uh, Javanese. But here we see correlations with um, Indian Coromandel Coast Kalamkari or Indian trade textiles. So um, just to sum up what we've just been through, um, you know, we, we see this very long Chinese involvement in the textile trade in Java, at least from the mid 17th century. And of course, the close connections between Indian, Indian trade cloths and batik, especially when we look at the Isen and Chochohan, and even to the kind of gold leafing of Prada. Lastly, I'd like to sort of um, highlight this kind of problem now when we think of batik persisir versus um, central Javanese and the idea of the, the kind of somber, sogan, classic batik versus the you see this word, which I, which I, which I find really incorrect, um, the gaudy persisir batik. In fact, the North Coast batik tradition is deeply connected to a very, very long tradition that even goes back to um, Majapahit times where colorful Indian cloths or just colorful textiles were worn. So, I really do think it's a myth to think of the classic tradition and the old tradition in Java as something that was very somber and, and restrained in colors, uh, restricted to soga and indigo. Um, in case you're falling asleep, I just thought to um, now for fun, uh, just look at the form of the sar sarong and terminology. Okay, you might be shocked, what am I saying? Um, Anyway, but yeah, the original meaning of sarong in, in, in Bahasa Melayu, uh, of course, this is vagina in Latin is literally just the sheath. It's not what you're thinking. So it's use in, in old Malay text uh, was strictly in the sense of like a sarong bantal, sarong kris, um, and not as a, a, a textile or a garment. Um, so what is interesting, so even in, when you look at Malay, Javanese, and Balinese, the older terms were Akain, Xinjiang, and Tapi. Of course, the form of the tubular skirt cloth is archaic and is known throughout the Indian Ocean. We see it in India, we see it in mainland Southeast Asia, um, in South China, and throughout the islands of the Nusantara and the archipelago. Now, what is really fascinating, it first appears in the 18th century in Dutch and Batavian manuscripts, and even in Chinese manuscripts. So it is actually, I believe, a term that came up in among the mixed race communities. It, it was sort of a, a Batavian city slang uh, for a skirt cloth, the tubular skirt, skirt cloth. And, and from, from Tavia, it's, it became a word that spread all over uh, island Southeast Asia. 
And therefore you can only find it in, for example, in Malay texts in the 19th century. So I believe it is really a Batavian word um, and a, a cosmopolitan that, that, that sort of um, developed in a very cosmopolitan mixed race environment. Uh, a quick glimpse into early Javanese batik. Um, the very earliest examples are also imitation, um, imitation ikats. The example on the left is possibly from Java to the eight, dating to the 18th or early 19th century. It was found in Southern Sumatra. It is block printed on hand woven, the kind of a tenun cotton. The example on the right um, is part of a collection of fragments from an aristocratic uh, samurai family, the Date family. Uh, it has many fragments of Indian chins, but also this very, very fascinating, probably Java, example of Javanese batik. And again, um, a kind of imitation, um, imitation ikat design, what, what we would later, um, what we would later, um, uh, in batik we know as nitik or jalamprang. So these, this tradition also is possibly one of the oldest for batik. Uh, here is also an example of a very old uh, nitik batik, which is now the Fukuoka Art Museum on a handloom cotton, probably dating to the 18th or early 19th century. And finally, this piece, which is in the tomb of, uh, which is now in the little museum in the tomb of Sunan Drajat in Pachiran in Java, is a ceremonial cloth, which I found thanks to Dr. Hélène Nyoto in Paris. Um, block printed and do notice again, this imitation ikat kind of staggered step design that we see here uh, next to the, Looks, whatever looks like a Chilean or something, but this sort of mountain design with these staggered step-like patterns. Again, sort of reference ikat. When we look at Chinese batik production from Chinese sources, it actually tells us something quite interesting. But here, here is a kind of quick timeline on um, batik in Indonesia. From in the 12th century, we see references to the term tulisawana, which um, might reference hand-drawn batik in old Javanese texts. 1518, we have the Sixakanda Karesian, which is a Chirabon manuscript, which um, is the first manuscript to reference wax applied to cloth, as well as batik patterns that we know now, like Merak Nigel Alas Alasan, Urang Urangan, and Kembang Teratai. Funnily enough, we find the first so far, um, this is still a work in progress, and. The, the curious thing is that the, the first reference to the word batik is not in an old Javanese text, but in a Dutch kind of trade record dating to 1641. Uh, now in 1648, there's a very interesting entry re relating to punishments for trading in counterfeits of Indian cloth. So we know that in Java, um, there were people producing copies of Indian trade cloths. And these probably exist um, in several museums. In fact, some of those I might have shown you could be Javanese imitations. Um, and the punishments were very serious. So this was quite a, for the Dutch, uh, a serious threat. Um, the first uh, reference to batik, probably from Java is actually found in a Malay manuscript Bahasa Melayu manuscript, the Hikayat Banjar, where uh, Kayan Batik is mentioned. This is dated to the 1760s. But in Javanese, actually, the first reference to the word Batik is, in fact, actually rather late uh, to a seven, sort of mid 18th century uh, manuscript called the Babat Sankala, which references something called an Adodotan Batik. Um, 1789, I will show you this really fun court case from Chinese, uh, from, a, from the Chinese court cases of Batavia. And come to the 19th century, we see really kind of industrial level production of batik and mention of batik dyas from Singapore moving to Batavia. 
and batik dyeing workshops in Patekuan, Jambatan, Lima, and Krawang. And we, by the 1830s, we see references of imports of batik into Singapore, including imitation batik. Now we have the, the Chinese records in Batavia, the Kung Anpu, and we see references to block printed batik called in batik or in in, Ch in Chinese is uh, stamped batik and hand-drawn batik is batik tuli in Hokkien. Um, we also see references in, in VOC trade records dating to the second half of the 18th century onwards where we it, it, mostly in estate inventories mentioning batik cloth handkerchiefs, selendangs, even to the referen reference of even to a reference of batik bang or red batik in the estate of someone called Ong Chiao Ko in 1764. Come to the early 19th century, we see tons of references of Chinese uh, owning or you know with you know batik selendangs and even uh, empty crates for dyeing of batik. So we we know of uh, Chinese involvement in batik making really from as early as the mid 18th century. Uh, this case is particularly fun, uh, a, a big quarrel between two investors, one called uh, Chiu Wei Guan and another one, Ong Li Ong, probably Li Ong Guan. Anyway, uh, both of them invested in batik and, uh, but the main problem was when the batiks were washed in water, all the color came off, which is ridiculed by the public and no one dared to buy them. So this is dated 1789. Now, the interesting thing is, which Stampert Raffles confirms in his uh, History of Java, that even up to that time, it was really hard to, to make a color fast red. Uh, the, this secret was held in India for the longest time. And even at, you know, in the late 18th century in Java, getting a color fast red was still very difficult as proven by this, uh, which is a, a document in the Kong Anpu or the records of the Chinese Council of Batavia. Um, then come to the 1830s, we see many references in Singapore newspapers at the, of that time. Um, we see here, for example, 173 cordages of batik handkerchiefs coming in to Singapore from, from Batavia. Uh, what's often forgotten when we think of North Coast batik is that uh, Batavia was one of the biggest producers of, of batik uh, for Singapore uh, up to the, the end of the 19th century. And we often, when we look at batik, you know, the, the emphasis is always uh, lasam, but um, there were many producers that were actually uh, based in Batavia. And this is the kind of batik that was coming to Singapore from the early 19th century. Um, made with little block printed stamp. And we see this lady wearing this kind of a, of a yardage that was sold and made into, um, into uh, kebaya panjang or baju panjang. And anyway, you know, when we, we look at, you know, when we think of bat, Chinese batik makers, I, 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 I express this word with um, a lot of caution. They were, often financed and owned by Chinese entrepreneurs, but um, the production was often a Javanese and involved Javanese and Arabs um, and Indians. Um, I think it was basically a multicultural endeavor. And sometimes, you know, it's misleading to think only in terms of the, the owners of the workshops when when we look as this picture clearly shows the, the multicultural aspect of it and, and uh, the dangers of, of, of plonking um, ethnic labels uh, when we look at batik coming from Java. Um, when we think of the, the Chinese producers of batik, you know, by coincidence or by twist, uh, you know, whatever, circumstances of history, uh, the producers were mainly from the north coast of, 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 of Java, stretching all the way from Jakarta to Surabaya and all the little ports along the coast. Um, where, 
one of the most famous, so, you know, especially among batik collectors, uh, were the batiks from Lhasam, which is here, sort of bit, almost a halfway point between Samarang and Surabaya. Um, we have this problem that anything that kind of looks like a traditional batik we call Lhasam. Um, I personally only would like to call pieces where you actually see a Lhasam stamp as Lhasam batik. Uh, one of the most prolific producers was someone called Ong Hong Hee. I know absolutely nothing about him, but many of his pieces were exported to Sumatra. And uh, they have these interesting stamps with Ong Hong Hee and OHH. Sometimes with this Jie Fu, or in Hokkien we say Kai Hok, Great Prosperity. Uh, they would look like this, and we see these uh, sold in huge quantities to Java, uh, to Sumatra, sorry. Here again with the Tumpal in the middle, or the Kapala in the middle. Um, and um, whenever you see these, look through your, your, you know, for collectors, really look out for the stamps. They're very, very interesting. Uh, some with human figures, often quite crudely made where the wax, as you can see, crackles quite often. Sometimes also we see them with blue and yellow as well. Um, we see also this other name, Lim Chuan Siu, here and in Chinese, Lim Lin Chuan Shou. Lim Chuan Siu, Lasam. Someone called Te Hua something or other, Lasam. Producing this kind of more classic pattern. And we see this Pranakan lady in Singapore wearing a very similar example. Also, please take note of a handkerchief. Uh, these were exported in huge quantities throughout the Strait Settlements, probably made all over, but especially I think in Batavia. Another name, Lim Biao An. However, he is the handelar, not the batik maker, the trader that's in Dutch, Java Lassam someone called Te Hui Tong. So we see many, many names and sometimes just um, Chinese motifs like this uh, rolled up book or maybe a scroll, but I think it looks like a, a rolled up Chinese book. Um, then we come to Surabaya and a very interesting group, which nowadays we might just call Lhasam. Uh, it's characterized by this dark brown kind of soga brown, a kind of uh, washed out orangey red and a deep blue and crackle. And this is an example that I found, which actually has a little old label saying Surabaya. Um, if you notice also with the kind of deep crackles throughout, um, it has been suggested that these could be made in Surabaya or Grisik. We also see uh, examples of traditional batiks, which um, some Batik scholars might attribute to specific towns, but I believe unless it actually has a stamp or some kind of label, I would be very cautious about saying that they come from anywhere in particular. Um, and here, you know, we associate this kind of Lokchan with Joanna and Rembang, for example, but Pekalongan also produced this kind of traditional Lokchan design. Lokchans were also made in Surabaya from this Yasper and Pengadi book. And we see very fine examples that clearly were not the kind that were of Joanna Rembang uh, Lokchans that were exported to Sumatra. These are the finest one, finer ones that were used and worn in Java. Uh, for example, in this picture of a Javanese lady, unsure if she's mixed race or Javanese or Pranakan on the left, and a Sumatran gentleman on the right wearing a scarf with a lokchan on silk design, often made of a synthetic, uh, like a polyester. Then we also have these kind of Chinese types, but clearly I'm not even certain that they come from Chinese workshops, but referencing Chinese uh, um, motifs. And then this kind very finely drawn um, have ended up quite often in Chinese Pranakan families not sure if they were made in Chinese workshops, but they are very fine workmanship um, and very fine Prada work. 
come to Pekalongan, which is of course the now known as the Batik city of Indonesia, but it's entry into Batik is actually quite late. I would say much later than Batavia and Samarang and Surabaya. Pekalongan, we see references to exports maybe in the 1860s, 1870s. We see these Chinese batik makers again, and know absolutely nothing about them uh, working in this batik Belanda style, this Nyonya Li Chu Ching. Um, the other interesting thing is um, uh, um, my late dear friend Harman Falthausen wrote this wonderful book called Batik Belanda. Um, unfortunately, he wrote about it uh, kind of genetically. It's about European or mixed race uh, Eurasian batik makers um, or Chinese makers married to Europeans. He unfortunately uh, left out people who made the same kind of batik at the same time who were Chinese or of other races. So um, this is kind of batik blanda style from the same period as the batik blanda. Um, and I think we should think of it as a multicultural style, as a fashion that became popular and saleable and was made across uh, batik makers of different communities and not just restricted or created by uh, just one community. So we, we, we see these fashionable batiks, Pekalongan style, I would say, that were made by Chinese, Arab, Javanese, European, Eurasian makers. Um, we see also this often this more commercial maker called Wee Chin Boon in Pekalongan. Um, then um, I'd like to also just mention, I, I'm, I'm just going to run through, kind of just highlight a couple of batik makers uh, this is in no way a, a list of the top makers. Um, more as I, I, I would like to just give uh, everyone a sense of the variety and the different types and histories of batik makers. Uh, it is at, in no means exhaustive. So here in Siduajo, we have an interesting batik maker doing very fine batik blanda so-called styles, uh, whose name was. Uh, Lim Sien Nyo, uh, or Mrs. Tan Sing In, Nyonya Tan Sing In. So she signed the batiks uh, in, different, in different ways. Uh, now, uh, August and I connected on this subject because um, his grandfather is, uh, uh, was a brother of Tan Sing In. I think uh, he might correct me there, but um, we went to the, the Tan family uh, cemetery to find the grave, but we couldn't find her grave. Um, but she was born in Lim, and the one on the lower left is uh, the widow Lim Si Hock, which could be her mother, I'm not sure. Uh, as sometimes this, the, this has been mistaken to be Sala, uh, to meaning solo, but it is SDA, which is a short form for Siduajo. Um, there were other makers in Siduajo, we see this Nonya, Mafrao, Tan, something. Um, anyway, there's a lot of work to be done on this subject of batik making in Sidu Ajo. Uh, the industry has completely died there. Um, another example of fine work she created. Um, the interesting thing is Nyonya Tan Sin Ing was only active in the 1910s to the 1930s. And then it stops. And then there's a story to why she stops making. Uh, but I, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done there. Um, then we come to someone like Wee King Lim in Pekalongan. He um, had a long career in batik making. We see pieces from the 1920s like this to very fine pieces in the 30s and up to the 50s. Um, interestingly though, I would say he had very competent batiks made in designs that were just fashionable of the period, but not in any way unique or recognizable. So, you know, sometimes when we, we just look at one piece, we don't get a sense of it. But when you pick up enough pieces and look at his whole career, what we, 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 we kind of get his kind of art historical sort of trajectory. And we see, uh, uh, you know, in his case, somebody who was a really good designer, a really good batik maker, perhaps not a very original designer. 
um, but making really, really high quality batiks. Going up right to perhaps even the 1960s. Uh, then we have a, a group of very interesting batik makers, three generations, uh, the Wee family, uh, starting with Nyawi Sun King um, in Pakalongan, and we have these very fine examples. This is her in her old age. Um, what we understand as Lassam style, but these were all made in Pakalongan. Um, I have, uh, Pak Hatono has told me that, you know, he's often described that how you can tell Pakalongan from Lassam, and it's this more naturalistic bird, as you see here, uh, seems to be much more a style from Pakalongan. Um, these are all her works, and you might kind of mistake this and call this Lassam, but this is Pakalongan. And again, an evolving style um, coming to the 1920s. And she seemed to have stopped making and handed over the business to her daughter-in-law, Nyonya Wee Kok Singh, Ko Ching Nyo, who was born in Surakarta. Here we have family pictures from Pakalongan, thanks to Ibu Ika Haribowo. Uh, the wonderful thing with Nyonya Wee Kok Singh, she stamped her batiks. Uh, this is from the 1920s, so we see pieces from the 20s here. So one dated 13 April 29, um, to these which were dated to the 1930s. And we see these are harder to find. Each piece um, has a really, in, you know, each piece is individual and unique with backgrounds that are not the same. Um, and you see someone who looks like such a traditional nyonya with these sort of wild modern patterns. I, I just find that amazing, combining art deco uh, and chins and batik and everything thrown together. She was an incredibly creative um, batik designer. And you see these very unusual backgrounds with, uh, I don't know, like, kind of like Christmas, Christmas tree decorations, I call this. Uh, um, and we just see each piece uh, being rather unique. And come to the 1940s, she's taken out the, the, the kind of batik dotting to create this sort of modern sort of floral design. And then here we see, you know, um, leaves, pink and bright pink and blue leaves um, and, and batiks with uh, little animals and attempt to be very modern. This one you can see data 9 September 41, we got seeing. Then uh, she also hands her business, retires and hands her business to her daughter. Um, and here we see a piece signed by both herself and her daughter, Miss Nyonya Lim Siok Hin. Nyonya Lim, Lim Siok Hin was born Wee Jin Nyo, the daughter of Mrs. Wee Kok Singh, later to become Jane Hendrith Matono the third generation of batik makers. And we see here with Ibutin and uh, with uh, Her Majesty Queen Yuliana. And we see pieces signed by her and, and a style that she liked, which she, you know, so-called kudu style with a sort of uh, brown backgrounds. Here we see Jane Hendrik Motono made in 1968. And these amazing white ground ones. Um, and, and we see how as an artist, she's kind of not just carried on what her mother was making. She had a style completely her own. Um, and we see three generations of very, very artistic women. Come Kudus and we see a, a, a completely different style. And the Kudus makers, the industry has died there, uh, like Lee Bun In, uh, like to work with these very somber backgrounds, this, this sort of like soga brown, but of course these were all chemical dyes. And, you know, I call these the highest DPI dot per inch of batiks produced in Indonesia. Uh, we see this crazy amount of fine work. And, you know, with um, kudus batiks, you'll never see a straight line. Everything has to be scalloped just to drive the, the, the batik maker crazy in, in, in in creating a fine piece. Everything is scalloped. Oh, sorry, this is skipped a few places. This is a photograph I found of uh, 
Nonya Libunin. Uh, and other batik makers, for example, Nyonya Tio Ngochi from Jalan Stasiun, number 12A. It's sadly no more a, a batik workshop. It is now a kind of sells electric, like you can buy like a, your, your light bulbs and stuff there now. And this, uh, I knocked on the door and found the family and they allowed me to, uh, allow me to make copies of these pictures. Um, but she also stopped making batiks in the 60s. Uh, could, could this batik makers produce these really fine examples like this by Ang Hin Poo, who is the mother of uh, Nyonya Tiong Ho Chi? Um, so then you also have Chinese communities, not in the Pasisir, but in, in Jogja and Solo. And of course, we have the Tiga Negri batik makers. I have a whole issue about Tiga Negri, but we don't have time for that today. Um, the, the thing with the, the three dyes, Soga, Indigo, and Red, these were available in every town. If we look at Jasper and Pringadi, which is a, a, a book which uh, reported on batik, batik manufacturing in Java in the early 20th century, um, they reported that, that all three dyes were available in every town. So theoretically, every Batik town could make Tiga Negri. I have seen Pekalongan Tiga Negri. I have seen Fansoilan Tiga Negri where every color is just local. Um, it must have been a particular style. We now understand it that uh, um, each color was dyed in one city, but Having interviewed a lot of batik makers, the the in you know this kind of process was probably not realistic because you couldn't do any quality control if you produce three three different colors in three different towns. You would have to send a batch. So if the batch came out badly, you, there was no way you could control it. So it it does not seem a very in, uh, efficient way to produce batik and, uh, apart from transporting them all over. And why would you do that when those colors were available in your own town? Anyway, this is a big problem which needs to be resolved. But anyway, uh, the term I think was possibly coined by the Chua family of Solo because we see that on their labels, Tiga Negri. And we only see references to batik Tiga Negri in, in the newspapers, maybe in the 30s, 40s and 50s. So it's not a very old term. Um, and other batik makers, interestingly, that need we need more work to discover, but like Nonya We Kok Kik Liet in Solo, and even batik makers in Jogja, for example, this producer Nonya Te Chin Singh, who produced uh, more traditional uh, batiks for the court, or in the style of the uh, batiks for the court. But here we see with the signature Te Chin Singh. Um, and as well as Persisir types of batiks and sort of Jawa Baro batiks. Anyway, um, that sort of kind of, I'm just run through everything very quickly and I'd like to just end with some concluding thoughts or questions about so-called this uh, kind of um, peek into Chinese batik production. Anyway, you know, I, I hope this talk kind of makes you think about whether we should think of batik so nationally, or should we not try and, and see it as something that, you know, belongs to global history and global, te global textile history. The other thing, thing I would like, you know, everyone to reconsider is whether batik is really a tradition or has it always been something that we could call fashion. If you, if you see how it's progressed and how um, makers and tastes and patrons and suppliers have shaped and reshaped batik, um, you know, I, I think it, it, it helps us to re-understand it and, and uh, you know, not, not as something fixed, but as something that has always been dynamic from since, since it, you know, appeared in the 14th, 15th century. The other thing that I hope you might reconsider 
is whether batik persisir is kind of new, gaudy, and nouveau, or is it part of a very old, modern, global textile tradition um, that goes back even to the Javanese court, but you know that 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 belongs to world textile history. Finally, you know, when we look at Chinese batik, when we think about the makers and people who contributed it to it, do, do we narrow things too, too much by thinking of it just in purely ethnic terms? Um, especially when we look at the diversity of styles, uh, the people who not only took part, um, quite often, uh, if you look at batik books, you might see references to that a certain piece was made by the Chinese community for the Chinese community. And I would also caution against that, that um, at the end of the day, willing buyer, willing seller, whoever had the money would just pay for whatever batik they wanted. Um, and we shouldn't think too narrowly that, oh, you know, if it has a Chinese pattern, only a Chinese person bought it, only a Chinese person made it. We have to remember that copying, as you could see right from the earliest days, how Ikat was copied it into um, Indian, into an Indian trade textile and into a batik, how these ideas translated across barriers and design in a, in a sense has no boundaries, technique does not have a boundary either. And as much as we do celebrate uh, Indonesia for carrying on something so special and, and a technique that has been so refined in Indonesia, I, I would celebrate this as not only a, a great national story, but something which is part of a greater national, international and global narrative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Oh, yeah, I just end with this fun ah. picture of my grandmother, which I love. <laughs> Being Elvis. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. So we have a few questions from the audience. There's a question from Kiwi Boy about, you know, about the trade textiles, the earlier trade textiles between India and Indonesia. If there were, uh, when did the two-way trade in textiles develop between India and Indonesia, if it ever did? And any ideas on where the love of clashing patterns may come from? Yeah, well, you know, we, we can only go by the, the carbon dates. Now, this is slightly controversial. Some people don't believe in carbon dates. Uh, some people think it, it, you know, that if we look at the dates and, and, and corroborate them with art of the same period and, and with historical and textual evidence, we might have more of an indication. And to, I personally support and believe the evidence that um, what the carbon date is showing that these, the earliest Indian trade textiles uh, come from the sort of so far mid to late 14th century, uh, mostly found in surviving examples have been found in Sulawesi. So they date from that period. Now with regard to the second question, you know, uh, the, the, a lot of work still needs to be done about, um, you know, the relationship between um, the, the merchants who could be Dutch, Gujarati, the, the, and the patrons, you know, the, from manufacture to, to distribution. Um, we know from the VOC records that, uh, from the notes that were made, that the Dutch were tailoring pieces for different islands because they would say, oh, this pattern doesn't work for this island. This color doesn't work for that island. This is, doesn't, blue doesn't sell here, only red ground. So um, some days somebody should really go through all these texts and, and work out um, the details more specifically. But it was definitely a two-way relationship. And I see clearly that, that for example, for the chintzes uh, ordered for Europe, um, they tend to just have one pattern, be they on a piece of yardage or a palampore. So this, this thing with clashing patterns that we see only for 
the textiles made for Indonesia. So clearly it was something in demand in Indonesia. Um, who decided that has yet to, to um, be determined, but clearly that, you know, we think of it as being so modern now. Uh, you know, we might see it on a Vuitton bag, you know, a pattern on pattern, that, you know, clashing patterns. But to think that this, this aesthetic is so Southeast Asian and so Nusantara, um, to me, uh, is so exciting. Um, but I, you know, this is just a thought I'm, I'm, I'm putting forward. We, no one's really looked into this actually, but clearly we see so many examples of these clashing patterns. Oh, wonderful. And then there's another question from Danny Prakosta. Peter, could you tell which part of the North Coast produced the Bang Biron mostly? And to where were those batik styles exported to? Okay, so this is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, one of the tricky, um, you know, tricky issues, you know, because right now, if you open many batik books, um, when you look at the description, uh, the, the, the makers, the, the, where they came from uh, is, is captioned very assuredly, like, oh, this is Lassam, this is, um, you know. And, and I believe if it doesn't say it, you shouldn't believe it. I mean, and how, how, you know, how, how would, it wouldn't pass through any sort of like court of law. Uh, you know, it, we, we, we need a, a better audit of, of textiles. So again, you know, when we, this is a prime example of how we, we need to be suspicious of any attribution. So these pieces were made by Nyonya Wisun King, uh, thanks to the Andrew Matono family for these pictures. But, um, you know, these might be described as lassam, uh, but they are held by the family um, as pieces made by um, Nyonya Wi, Sun King. So I would just say that we can never ascertain unless we have um, evidence. But, you know, I, I mentioned one theory was the birds, right? But here you can see Nyonya Wi, Sun King made, you know, batiks with the more abstract birds, as you see here, and the more naturalistic one as well. So that throws that idea out of the window. Um, so, you know, I, I would actually say that we can never tell. And also, you know, basically commercial enterprise would encourage anyone to copy any design uh, and try their damnedest just to make money. And these, these were sold everywhere. Um, quite often though, in my experience, I found the very, very finest pieces were ordered locally by uh, the rich people of the town. Um, very few of the highest quality pieces went uh, overseas for export. I've interviewed some batik sellers and you, you know, when we, we look at all Singapore newspaper reports, we might see a batik seller, an Arab batik seller, and he might have three in a safe uh, you know, of, of the finest batiks. So I think they were ordered in small quantities that were very expensive and only very, very wealthy patrons could afford to buy them. Um, so by and large, the finest pieces, hand-drawn ones were, uh, the patrons were all local, um, but when they were exported to Southeast Asia, it could be come from anywhere. And, and now because of the, their circulation through secondhand markets and, and dealers all through the island, we have no way of ascertaining any of this. Mm. Okay, maybe we have one last question. There is an Ibu Indrawati from Linas Batik. She wants to know why you didn't mention Chirabon. Is it because they're mostly unsigned? Uh, no, I, yeah. Actually, you know, I, the, the one thing that I had to say, you know, I, I, this is in no way exhaustive. Um, my, my, my aim of showing these, you know, highlighting these Batik makers was just to to give a sense that, you know, when you open a batik book, we, we just have one picture of one batik maker and one example. We don't really realize that they, their careers were very different. So we, for example, we, we have Nonya Tan Sin Ng, 
who was producing batiks only in the 30s or Nonya um, Lee Bun In as well. They, they, they were just active for a very short period and produced very fine examples. But, you know, obviously I, I left out, you know, famous batik makers like uh, Wee Su Chun and also but the Batik Linas family in Chiribon. Um, yeah, there is a very interesting question which I had asked Ibu Gyo and Ibu um, Jenny from Batik Linas in Chiribon. Why we don't really see signed Chiribon pieces? Um, nobody has been able to give me an example. There, there might be one or two, but by and large, Chirobon, we know, produced really fine batiks. And there were many Chinese uh, batik makers there as well. Um, the Batik Linas family tells me that uh, both the father and the mother, the Tio family also, I think on the mother's side, were batik makers. And they sold especially to Palembang and different places in Chirobon. They also made Lokchan. So um, again, I'm finding that yeah, the, the, there is a big question about batik production in Chirobon. And also interestingly, I saw the family's collection of Lokchan made on this sort of a synthetic material that we sometimes mistake as, mistake as silk. Um, and they tell me that they produce this kind of batik for, for Sumatra. Um, and, you know, so yeah, that, this is another example. We, we see in Batik book so many pieces described as being from Chirobon. Sometimes I have might have a strong suspicion, but you know, your guess is as good as mine. We, we you know, to plonk a, a Chirobon label, we have to be really certain, and I'm not. Thank Again, you. It's one of the very important Batik centers, yes, which I left out not not because it wasn't important, but um, I I um. Yes, I just wanted to highlight a few stories to show the varieties of um, mm -hmm. Batik histories. I think you'll have to hold a full day conference if you wanted to <laughs> talk about all the different styles, wouldn't you? But um, yes, I'd like to thank you, Peter, so much because it's always um, mind blowing to see your presentations. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining here today. And um, yes, big applause. And should we take a group photo? Yes, I think so. So, if do I have to stop wants, share? I think if everyone wants to turn on their cameras, I mean, if they want to, I mean, it's really an option. But we can take a group photo with everyone. And don't forget to um, follow our Instagram on Mitra Museum Jakarta, Mitra Museum JKT on Instagram, and our website also. Oh. Shall we take a photo in three, two, one? Do we have everything? Do we have everyone? Sorry. Okay, maybe another one. Three, two, one. Okay. Yes. Thank you again, Peter, and um, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Agustin.